For someone recently released from incarceration, the quickest path back into custody is to reoffend. AB 109 has enabled hundreds to become eligible for early release from area detention centers. The problem is that many have no hope once they're out those doors. They have no marketable skills, no place to live, little options. Hi everyone, I'm Mary Beth Garrison, your host for Inside Kern, the program that seeks to demystify county programs, services, and projects. On this edition, we're going to take a look at the impact of AB 109, the California Assembly Bill that seeks to close the revolving door on lower level offenders cycling in and out of detention centers. We learned in our first part that Kern County Sheriff has developed programs both in and out of custody that are having an impact. Today, we're going to talk to Kern County Probation, Mental Health, and one of our local policymakers, and we'll see how they tie in and are integral to the success of AB 109 here in Kern County. So stay with us as we continue to uncover the true impact of AB 109. We deal with with you guys daily and so many of you guys are resistant in coming into the program. I uh, spoke with someone earlier today who was extremely resistant and was trying to find various reasons. I mean, you name it, he was coming up, the distance, um, looking for a job, my kids, um, it's a long walk, uh, my bike's flat. Just every excuse possible to come here. Hearing you guys talk right now, in all honesty, I'm sitting here and I'm listening and I think about all the participants that are in the program right now. You know, my, my partner could... Uh, she can agree with me it makes us feel better knowing that there's success out there that you guys can come in do this program uh, stay clean and realize that it's never too late to correct your past mistakes that there is a future going forward to have you guys in this room it's like i, I wish we could bring all 200 participants into an auditorium so you could talk and they could hear you guys uh, because they're great stories and they're truth you know it's all it's all true everything you guys have gone through uh, the substance abuse uh, breaking the law being violated going to jail going to prison but still seeing a light in all that dark but you guys persevered and you drove through it and I just, I, that would be something for everybody to hear what you guys have gone through and you know that it can be done because your success stories, they're not just your success stories, they're his, they're yours, they're yours, they're even our success stories. Today, out of custody needs are being addressed positively and aggressively, helping to fill the gaps that for some was previously seen as an insurmountable barrier. T.R. Miracle, the county's chief probation officer, is thrilled with the results his department is having. Hi, T.R., how are you? Doing great, Mary Beth. Perfect. Tell me, if you would, about your experience in probation. Sure, I've been with the probation department about 19 years. I started my uh, career as a group counselor in Juvenile Hall, and I've kind of worked all over the department investigation, supervision, the adult division, the juvenile. About four or five years ago, I was appointed as the division director, and it was over the adult division. And during that time is when AB 109 passed. And we had a lot of uh, new experiences and a lot of new responsibilities that we had to take. And so I was really on the ground floor of that when that happened. And I've been chief probation officer for about a year now, and I'm really excited about the programs that we're doing. So you spoke of AB 109. Tell me how AB 109 has changed the way Kern County Probation is doing business. Sure. Well, the first thing is AB 109 passed a lot of state responsibilities down to the county. And so from now compared to then, we have about 3,000 more um, adult felony offenders that we have to supervise. And so when we had that, we figured, well, 
and we have limited resources. So what's the best way that we can get the biggest bang for our buck? And the cornerstone of our thing is that we have an evidence-based assessment. And what this assessment does is it helps uh, predict the risk level for someone to recidivate, either a high, moderate, or high level. And so we're able to use our resources targeting the highest risk people to recidivate. So we'll have smaller caseloads and more services for those type of offenders. And that way, we're getting the best bang for our buck and making sure that we can make the biggest change in recidivism with our clients. So upon release through AB 109, what kind of programs, what types of programs are available? And that's an, another exciting thing about AB 109. It came upon us really fast, but what we were able to do is we did get some additional funding from the state, and we all got together, the entire county, the sheriff, mental health, probation, and all the other departments, and got together and said, what's the best use of this? And so we really said, we need to do programs that are going to reduce recidivism. And so we're still going to hold people accountable, and public safety is very important, but long-term public safety is going to be accomplished by uh, changing people's behavior. So we have all type of uh, programs that are available now, from sober living environments, to um, employment um, opportunities, to uh, evidence-based treatment. These are treatments that have been proven to reduce recidivism, and that's what we do here at the Day Reporting Center, is that we really focus on evidence-based treatments and focusing on people's top needs. So if I came to the Day Reporting Center, what would I expect? What, what would my day look like? Well, uh, there's, it's a typically about a six-month program. It can take longer depending on how well you do. But when you first come, you're reporting every single day. And you're starting with, you get alcohol tests, and you could be randomly drug tests. So we want to make sure that we're looking on people's sobriety. And then what we do is there's, a, uh, there's an assessment tool that looks at what are called criminogenic needs. And that's a fancy way of basically saying these are areas in someone's life that's going to cause them to recidivate. It might be substance abuse, anger, criminal thinking. And so what they do is they tailor different programs that they offer here to address those top criminogenic needs. And the evidence shows if you do that, then you can reduce recidivism. So they'll come for a different type of programming, um, treatment, and then also um, other things like such as getting uh, employment readiness, employment opportunities. And then what they do here as well is they try to target or try to connect with other um, agencies out in the community. So if there's something that they can't do here, you know, they have those referrals. But really it's uh, being checked on every day. They work with our officers, our probation officers are coming and checking on. And so it's just kind of a one-stop one shop for all their needs. But it sounds like it's customized to the needs of the individual. Is exactly. That true? That's exactly. It's not everyone gets the same type of treatment because uh, at first of all, you're not going to get your bang for your buck with that because if everyone's, mm -hmm. someone may not need substance abuse treatment, well, they're not going to get it. So we use that assessment tool and that tells us what the needs are, and then it's tailored to their specific needs, and we follow through with that. So I know that to be successful, we need a, we need a safe home environment. What role does Kern County Probation play in finding a safe home environment? Sure. And, uh, a, a safe home and sobriety is really important as people try to come over you know, years and years uh, of abuse and criminal behavior. So some of the things that we do is we actively go out into people's homes. You know, we're doing checks, we're uh, drug test people, we're doing searches of their houses to make sure that they're following through. And when we find problems, you know, we're going to re refer people to services. Or if it's bad enough, you know, we might violate them and put them back in custody. But the whole thing is that even if we might do that, the thing is to get them back into services because eventually they're going to get out. So the only way that we're going to have a safer community is that we get them into treatment, we get them into programs, I mean, we change the way they think and the way they behave. And if we do that, we're going to have a much safer community. So how many staff people do you have in Kern County Probation? And then who do you work with? Because I, I recognize not everyone in, in the center is a county employee. Right. With the whole department, for we have over 600 employees. On the adult side, we have about 150 or so. Now, specifically for the DRC, we have about five or six officers or supervisors that are, are connected to the program. And what the program is, is it's a, a partnership with uh, BI Incorporated. And what they do is they've run DRCs all over the country. And so we've contracted with them. We work very well, our officers and the staff here, um, to provide the services. So that's one of a partner that's been a really beneficial partnership uh, for probation in Kern County. Now, who do you partner with for vocational training? How, how do people become ready for an employment? Sure, there's uh, several things that we do. Uh, we work with uh, Employee Trainers at Resource, um, ETR. We also, here at the Day Reporting Center, they have some job readiness. And then there's other um, community-based organizations that we contract with that can help with certain skills, such as construction. So, do you think your programs work? 
Uh, I don't only think they do, I, I know they do, and that's the exciting part of this program is what we do is we're using evidence-based uh, programs, and so that these are programs that have been tested across the nation that have been shown to reduce recidivism. So if you do these programs with fidelity, you do it the right way, we know we'll reduce recidivism. But even above and beyond that, a couple years ago we did um, a, a, a assessment on this DRC. We found that it greatly reduced recidivism by between 30 and 40 percent for a control group versus the graduates. And that kind of um, uh, results are really impressive you know, on the national level. And it makes even more when you think about a, a conviction cost, Kern County, every conviction over $30,000 in direct and indirect cost. So every time we can reduce a conviction, we're making a great difference. Not only are someone not being victimized, but we're saving taxpayers money. Another thing is we're changing the lives of people here where they're able to go back, they're sober, they're having a job, and they're able to reconnect with their family. So all those things are really exciting. So if you had an opportunity to tell the general public that might be fearful of the early release program, what would you say? Yeah, i say I would understand that. You know, when you people are being released from custody, that, that's a natural thing, you know. And the first thing is public safety is always our number one concern. So if somebody needs to be arrested, if somebody is in violation to the extent that someone is in danger, we're going to do that. And I want to reassure the public that public safety is always number one. But from a long-term perspective, we're going to have better public safety if we're able to change the way people behave, the way they think. And these type of programs are the programs that do do that and I know it, it's been proven and it's working here and so that's I'm excited about that. So with over 20 years in in probation is this a different way of doing business? Yeah it's, it's definitely a different way especially on the adult side. In, in the juvenile side we've always been a little more I think treatment oriented but in the past uh, for adults it was kind of like you're an adult these are the rules follow it if you don't we're gonna lock you up. You know, and it, I think it proved that that didn't work. People just kept going back into custody over and over again. So when 109 came along, it gave us an opportunity to say, hey, let's try things differently. And the entire county really bought on. Not everyone agreed with 109, but everyone agreed it's here. So how can we as a county address it and what can we do that's going to make it better? And so some of the changes that we've made is our assessment. So we're making sure we're targeting the right people. We're able to offer more services. And then also that kind of a change in our mindset that if People have been getting in trouble for years and years and years. It's not, it's not a, you know, it's unrealistic to think that all of a sudden they're just going to change. And sometimes they might stumble, but that we're going to give them another chance. We'll hold them accountable, but they might need to go into the program one or two or three times. And we're not going to give up on them. We're going to keep keep trying until they succeed. Now, what is lacking? If you received more funding, where would you put it? Yeah, I think we've done a good job of putting the right type of programs here in Kern County. The sheriff has greatly uh, increased their services in custody, mental health has increased, ETR, ourselves. What it really is is just a lack of capacity. You know, I think we're doing the right type of things, but there's so many people and not enough money. So I think we just need to expand all the good things that we're doing, and that's where I would focus on. Perfect. Any other comments that you have? Anything you would like to say? It's just that uh, I want the, you know, the community to know that um, we're here for public safety, and long-term public safety is turning people's lives around. And I want everyone to know that if there's danger, we'll take care of it, but long-term programs like this is gonna make people's lives better, and it's gonna make Kern County better. Kern County Mental Health is a willing partner with Kern County Sheriff and Probation. They're offering some programs that help to address some of the challenges that an AB 109 participant might face. Up next, we'll learn about some of the innovations in programs. Stay with us. I am very happy to just be part of this change. And maybe I didn't have an impact on each of their lives, but just the success that they were able to do this. Because I think right now, that's what we're hopeful. Me and Officer Garcia, or any officer who works here, we work so closely with everybody. We give them a million chances. You know, we, we work with them through their drug addiction, and it's very difficult. I'm not going to lie, you know, because we heard the lies. We, you know, they, you know, they failed our promises. You know, obviously they, they failed a lot of things, but ultimately we like it when they come to a place in their lives when they want this change. So, and it's very rewarding because we work with BI Close. I said we meet once a week. They let us know their progress, and once we see that, because they obviously <coughs> notice it right away, we get happy because obviously something is working. And they put all that effort. You know, we were just there to guide them. Um, well, I've had um, a great run with VI. Uh, I've been here about four and a half years now, and I've 
actually was Mr. Marsh's case manager at one point. Um, and I've seen each and every one of you individuals graduate this program. And I've seen you from the resistance stage to, I mean, who you guys are today. Um, and it's an honor, you know, to have been at least a part, a, some part of your guys' transformation. Well, when I first came to the program was in March of 2011. Yeah. And like I said, when, when I first came, it was kind of like a trick to me, you know, either you come or you get violated. So it was like, all right, let me deal with it, you know. But I, I didn't care for the program at all, you know. It like, took me a while to actually be able to start to appreciate what the program could do for you if you're willing to, you know, take the opportunities. So I had my issues, you know, with being sober. So, you know, drug tests I always failed and you know, but never come to class really, you know, like, and they would get on me for it, you know. But the good thing was they, they weren't quick to violate me. That's one thing I can say about BI, that, you know, they were willing to work with me, you know. So that kind of helped me to see that, okay, if you're willing to go this far for me, at least let me try to meet you halfway or something, you know, show you that I won't, you know, just take it for granted. So in due time, you know, everything worked out in the end, yeah. Kern County Mental Health recognizes that many who have been incarcerated have suffered a traumatizing event at some point in their lives, leading to very real mental health concerns. Kern County Mental Health staff work with people at both in-custody and out-of-custody programs. Their impact is astounding. As the head of the Kern County Mental Health Department, Bill Walker is proud to be part of the team that's reducing recidivism in Kern County. Hi Bill, how Hello. are you today? I'm good, how about yourself? I'm well, thank you. Recidivism, tell me, what is recidivism and how do you track it? You know, it's funny, recidivism is actually one of the most important things to track for our AB 109 funds. And there's really three types. First, recidivism is something that happens again. In that regard, for us, the three things we monitor is recidivism, of incarceration, meaning that people are locked up or incarcerated more than once. The second is recidivism of people going into psychiatric hospitals more than once. And the third is people becoming homeless more than once. So part of the goal of AB 109 and our integrated efforts is to reduce recidivism of incarceration, hospitalization, and homelessness. And are you accomplishing the goals that you set? Actually, we're knocking it out of the park. If and, but there's really two ways of looking at it. The first is for people who stay in service, stay in treatment, whether it's services with us, the Mental Health and Substance Use Department, whether it's the Day Reporting Center with probation or some of the programs through the, through the Sheriff's Office, if they stay in these treatments, then we've actually reduced um, reincarceration recidivism by 76%. Wow. We've reduced the homelessness by I believe somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 40%. And we've reduced the hospital rehospitalization recidivism by over 50%. That's pretty significant. Now, tell me some of the programs that you're doing. Certainly, and there's, there's, there's two types of program areas. One is programs that we do in the incarceration facilities, and then there's programs we do in the community. If we start with the incarceration facilities, the two areas of programs are substance abuse and mental health, and we use evidence-based programs like seeking safety, moral rec recognition therapy, and the goal of these is really twofold. One is to deal with their mental health needs and substance abuse needs. The second is to help educate them so that they'll be able to take care of themselves as they get out. What needs are the greatest that need to be addressed and how are you addressing those needs? Thank you for that question. Um, as, a, as a trifecta of the Sheriff's Department, probation and mental health, we really look at the criminogenic needs which are what are the issues people need. And so part of it from our side is, well, they need to be mentally stable. If they have a drug problem, they need help and services for that. Because if those aren't addressed psychiatrically, program-wise, well, then they're, they're going to fail. But on the other side, they often need a safe place to stay, sober living environments. They often need uh, education. They often need job training and coaching. And then they also need um, other supports for their, for their families and friends so that they don't fall back into bad habits. And so there's a combination of services that each different provider adds to this in a continuum of care for the individual. What services specifically does mental health provide? 
Mental health provides some of the more intense services for those that are seriously mentally ill or have serious drug problems. And so as services themselves, it can, it can be everything from seeing a psychiatrist for medication, having a case manager who checks on you regularly to make sure you're following your treatment. It can be a nurse who's checking on you. It could also be specialized groups for trauma-informed care, for teaching people uh, coping skills for their mental illness. It's an array of services that we try to wrap around the individual. We also uh, certify the sober living environments that many of these individuals live in to make sure they're living in a safe environment. And that's critical, correct? I, a, a safe place to live. Certainly. Actually, you know, it's, it's funny. The way I describe housing is that I have three adult children. And if you were to walk into my house, I can point to each room, and we describe that room by the name of the child who was raised in it. Housing is so critical to people, but we'll move people around like it isn't. And we need to appreciate that people who have the deficits of, of histories of mental illness and substance abuse have the same need for home that we have. Now, are people eager to sign up and come into your programs? Absolutely not. I mean, nobody thinks what I want to do is I want to go get services from the mental health department. I mean, not usually. All right, what I want to do is go get substance use services. Really, the, it's very interesting the, the way we actually engage people now while they're incarcerated and get them understanding the need for their sobriety, the need for their mental health services, and then through the support of the probation department that's going to work with them as they get out from the legal side, the sheriff's department that's working with them in the incarceration facility, and us as they come out, you generally get a 180. Uh, not a 360, that's going back incarceration, that's recidivism. A 180 of attitude of this is what I need to keep my life in order. Have you seen success? We've seen a lot of success. Matter of fact, one of the things that we publish in a quarterly to the Board of Supervisors every month is, is stories of success. People who have come out. So there's the anecdotal story of the person who will stand up and say, I used to wear an ankle bracelet, and I don't mean because they look nice, um, and, and I used to be someone you should not trust. But now they're, they have a job, uh, they're, they're contributing to society, um, and so we have a lot of anecdotal stories. I think I mentioned earlier, statistically, you can look at the statistics of success, which we actually measure as reduction in, in hospitalizations, reduction in incarcerations, and reductions in homelessness. And they range between 40 to 76 percent, depending on which monitor you're talking about. Who are your community partners? We have several community partners, of course the Sheriff's Department and of course probation, but we also have programs like um, uh, ETR and we have programs like uh, the school districts. Uh, we have programs that relate to um, uh, the CBOs, which is community-based organizations who provide the SLEs and sometimes job training and, and other educational opportunities. So in addition to Kern County Sheriff and probation, community partners, who are they? You know, one of the partners that, is, that has been very special is the Mexican American Opportunities Foundation, MAOF is what they're commonly referred to. And what they actually do is help people both uh, get their GEDs, if they don't have a GED, they get uh, job placement, job opportunities, educational opportunities. And they're just one of the partners that does that. And that's one of the criminogenic needs because many of the people who are coming out of jails and prisons are poorly educated, poorly job trained, and even if you help them with the other areas, that still is an area that leads to recidivism if it's not addressed. Now tell me about MET, or MET team. Mm -hmm. I've heard that word. What, what is that? In the late 90s, um, we replicated what some, some places in California already had, which is a mobile evaluation team. It is a team that responds directly to dispatch in the community, so, so the legal dispatch they get a call and they think this person may be mentally ill, they can call our team out and we will come to that location, do an evaluation. Now, that has changed. There's been a shift, even in, in Kern County Sheriff, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of, of working and dealing with people that are potentially mentally ill. That is 100% correct. Matter of fact, we are, through the AB 109 funds, uh, and with the Sheriff's full support, matter of fact, his office contacted my office because we've always run our units as separate. So law enforcement would get called to an event and then they would call for mental health. We now are doing a co-facilitated team which is law enforcement, the sheriff's office, and our staff in the same car. And they do two things. They can do a first response. They get a call that they think is a mentally ill call. They can be dispatched to that call. But what they also do is they jointly go out with people who are AB 109 uh, caseload 
and they check on them. So law enforcement and mental health together so that they don't have the stigma and they don't have the fear of law enforcement. Many times when there's a bad event with law enforcement, the situation goes out of control radically quick. Mentally ill often don't respond to orders of compliance. And so when that order by the law enforcement officer is to comply, quite often they get the opposite response. Usually the officer or, or the deputy manages that. And, and at times it escalates beyond control. We're trying now, to eliminate that. Is this typical around the state? Is everyone doing this kind of thing? Not everyone is doing it. Actually, in the mental health department, they are specifically funding us to try to increase these kind of services and crisis services. Um, I can't speak more highly of the probation and sheriff's department and how they've approached some of these events. The sheriff, for example, uh, we also do something called crisis intervention team, which is a training module that mental health and the, the legal entities of your community work together to train uh, and co-train all of our staff. The sheriff has embraced that model that he now has beginning, and this is the first class is, is happening right now, where while they're still in the academy, before they actually become you know, feet on the street, they would actually go through this training. So their first culture of training will include how to work with mentally ill and substance abusers in the community. So are there gaps remaining as you work with AB 109 uh, early release folks? There's always gaps. You know, the biggest gap is simply capacity. Um, capacity is can you provide the level of service across the board that everyone needs to reduce and eliminate recidivism? You know, um, we are one of the most underfunded AB 109, I think we may be the most underfunded per capita AB 109 in the state of California. Matter of fact, that is so important to us that Supervisor Perez has actually joined a committee, become, I think, uh, one, of the, um, one of the chairs or co-chairs to that committee to specifically try to address that. If we had that more funding, we would have more co-response units. We would have more people setting up educational programs. Sometimes people say, are you coddling people? I don't think you're coddling people if you're actually reducing crime, uh, getting people back into jobs, paying taxes, making your house and my house safer. Um, I, don't think, I don't think that's coddling anyone. It's actually giving people the opportunity to get it right. So certainly there are costs to AB 109, just as you said. But what would you say, if you flip that, what's the benefit of AB 109? Well, you know, the, the interesting thing is when, when you're forced to do things and you have to look at your models and say, how are we doing things? Before AB 109, and I'm not looking at so much of people getting released, I'm looking for if you're going to give us dollars to try to address problems, what do we do with those dollars? So one of the things we did is we now have dedicated services in the local jail for people who are substance abusers. That didn't exist before AB 109. I could tell you, uh, we work through a group called uh, the Pew Institute for Results First Evidence-Based Programs, and part of what they show is that engaging people while they're incarcerated leads to a huge improvement in people maintaining services when they get released. And so one big benefit of AB 109 is it's funded us to actually set up mental health and substance abuse services in the jail at a much higher level. So if you had additional funding, additional dollars coming into current, mm -hmm. where would you put those dollars? Looking at AB 109 dollars, there's a few places that I would strategize. Um, First, we are already looking at building a new jail. The sheriff's already got that going. Um, right now, I think we serve over 70% of the people in the jail for mental health services. So one of the places we would need to increase is the mental health and substance abuse services, whether it's our department or some other you know, contracted group, to increase those services in the jail. That's number one. Second, Results First has given us very clear evidence-based programs that we can implement in the community. The Day Reporting Center from Probation is a great example. It has one of the, one of the highest positive impacts of any model that we have going or in the state of California. Um, after that, you start breaking it down. Um, what programs for mental health, what programs for substance abuse, what programs for education, what programs for living environments, and literally you would want to incrementally increase them based on the needs and there's actually an assessment of each individual in AB 109 that the sheriff of the probation department does so they know which of those criminogenic needs they need. And so we could actually pilot it and say, we need to increase housing by 30% or 40% or whatever. And so that's really the model we need to approach. What message do you want to leave with our viewers about AB 109? I think, I think 
First off, the hysteria and stigma of people coming out of prison that that's going to destroy our community, that I would want to say that that's absolutely not the case. Uh, I think what we really need to look at is the message of providing the appropriate services so that we can actually change that behavior. Certainly if people come out and we do absolutely nothing, you know, someone who only knows a life of crime will continue a life of crime. Only knows a life of drugs will continue a life of drugs. If we actually use the funds prudently to reduce those recidivisms and, and to reduce the recidivism of homelessness, to reduce the recidivism of incarceration and hospitalization, you have to reduce things like substance use, mental illness, and give them opportunities to get educated, to get jobs. Any final thoughts? No, I actually, um, you know, the working with the different agencies and the public, um, this has just really been a really great opportunity for us, and I'm just, I'm just pleased to be part of it. Thank you. And I know they're pleased to have you. Thank you. Kern County Sheriff, Kern County Probation, Kern County Mental Health, working together like never before. Truly one of the benefits of AB 109. Up next, you're gonna hear from the champion, Supervisor Perez, as she touts the progress we're making in Kern County. Stay with us. Yeah, my name's Andy. Um, personally, uh, I got so much to say, you know. I, I didn't plan on talk, talking on camera, but, um, you know, I guess the truth of the matter is, is that I've always been a believer. Something in my, I've always had the spirit of, I could do anything. And I'll, I'll be honest, uh, I, I did drugs for over 16 years of my life. I only went to the ninth grade. Uh, I graduated college when I, when I was 21 years old, but you know, there was a lot, of, a lot of time in my life where you know, I, I wasn't nobody, I mean, realistically speaking, but you know, the way I, I guess what I wanna say is, um, I, you know, when you start doing drugs, I mean, how many of us really said, oh, I'm going to do drugs for the rest of my life, you know? That wasn't my idea, you know? But when would I quit is a very important question because years went by and I never quit. I mean, you, you, you get, you start to like it because you, you're with all your other, your other, you know, like I said, my brothers now, because we share so much of ourselves right. with each other, our past, our future, you know what I mean? Everything. And it brought us, uh, brought us, uh, Real close. I mean, mm -hmm. even in here as and out there, but I still talk to them. All the stories mm -hmm. might not yeah, be the same. Right. Right. Stories ain't the same, but it's right. the same. It's a natural respect that we have for each other because we already know. We can look at each other and already know where we're going, yeah. not where we used to be. Right. Kern County policymakers have been working diligently to support departments with the challenges of AB 109. District 5 County Supervisor Leticia Perez is one of our best advocates. Hi, Leticia, how are you? Very good, thank you. Good to see you. Nice to see you as well. So tell me what your involvement with AB 109 has been. Well, for starters, you know, I am a big believer in redemption. Uh, I believe very strongly when the dots are connected appropriately and the right people come together uh, with good faith, and in operating with the best intentions, uh, we really can get a lot done. In fact, I think we can accomplish anything. So I was thrilled to be able to represent the Board of Supervisors on the AB 109 uh, Community Corrections Partnership that, as you know, involves all of the critical partners in Kern County, Sheriff, Police Chief, DA, Public Defender, uh, Probation Chief, and all of the players that really uh, have to be united in this effort if we're really gonna help people achieve their potential and really lead a lifestyle that we know is so destructive and really be able to be law-abiding, uh, happy, healthy people and improve this community. So how have you seen the way the county is doing business change? Well, it's been truly remarkable. I was a public defender in my former life and I had thousands of cases and I always like to say that the number one question I was ever asked as a public defender was, Miss Perez, can you help me get a job? And it was a crushing reality that I could not. Uh, the overwhelming odds were that I was looking at somebody who was uh, functionally illiterate, uh, tattoos uh, sometimes right in your face, um, not a marketable skill set, uh, not stable housing, 
uh, really every sort of ding against a person that allows uh, you know what we do to function on a regular basis, right? The uh, everyday citizens that pay taxes and go to work, and uh, we need stable housing, we need transportation that's reliable. All of these pieces are absent with this particular population, and so the answer to that question was almost always no, I could not. And that is tragic because uh, with all of the resources being spent and the honest passion of a person sitting in front of me wanting to redeem themselves, I didn't even know where to send them. So with that world to where we are now, uh, I don't even feel like I'm operating in the same county, frankly. Uh, this is a new world. It is a sea change. The conversation has shifted. The players have shifted. The money has shifted. And now we're in a place where we can actually uh, put into practice ideas, best practices around the country, You know, a paradigm that we know helps people or can help people when they're serious uh, You know, transition their lives into a place of stability. And so I don't feel like I'm in the same county. I've, I've left California, I've gone to a different county, and I'm happy to, to have done so, uh, frankly, because it, it is a new world. And that's exciting because for the first time, I have clients come into my office that I used to represent as a public defender. They still visit me all the time. And for the first time, the question, can you help me get a job? My answer can honestly be, yes, I can. And that's exciting. So exciting. So tell me, as a policymaker, what decisions or what uh, policies have you helped implement that are making a difference? Well, most importantly, we have real capacity challenges in Kern County, and really we see this all throughout the state of California. And in a place as deeply Im as impoverished as Kern County, we see it more pronounced, as well as the entire valley. So building capacity at the local level is so critical. That takes money, that takes prioritization, that takes often hand-holding for folks that are well positioned to care for people, to uh, really genuinely mentor those folks and help them get from A to A.5 to B to B.5. You know, the small baby steps that really help a person understand and comprehend you know, what it means to function every day as a sober person, uh, to function every day as a parent. Uh, that is not, you know, losing one's cool and behaving badly and, and, and t handing down bad habits. I mean, that's a lot of work. And so to transition folks from a particular lifestyle set into one that we know is going to be beneficial to their families, to themselves, and to this community takes a lot of work. So what we have found is that a lot of the community-based organizations, a lot of folks, churches and, and community groups that are on the ground, and they're well positioned to do this because they really love people and they've devoted mm -hmm. their lives to it, often are not the same groups that are well positioned to compete for money, to compete for grants, to know how to collect three years of financials and present them to a government entity and say, please give me money. So connecting those two worlds is really our fundamental challenge here. And since now we have a pool of money that we can work with, we have a, you know, a district attorney who I think shocked California when she said, we're gonna put the entirety of our growth funds into CBOs at her own detriment when she could have competed for those dollars and very likely would have gotten what she asked for. She, to her own sacrifice, said, I think this should go to CBOs. That is a whole new world and that's exciting, but we have to continue to build capacity at the local level so that those groups that are well positioned and frankly can do it a lot cheaper than government uh, are actually stable, legitimate, credible, and can take those dollars and make them go a lot further than uh, government can, frankly. So you have departments who are working together like never before you know, the sheriff department, probation, mental health, and they are working with these community-based organizations in new and exciting ways. Yes. Has that ever happened before? You know, in my experience, the law enforcement folks, whether it be probation or the sheriff or BPD, mm -hmm. were all present and knowledgeable about these groups, but it was much more of a uh, hostile relationship, if you will, one in which there was a lot of oversight and accountability, but not necessarily partnership. And so in this new world, folks have been given the opportunity to get to know each other, to sit down and go, okay, these are the mandates from the state of California. This is what Kern County would like to see us be doing. We want to lead the state. You know, we don't want to be behind everybody else. I, I think we're well positioned to lead. We have some of the greatest challenges, some of the toughest demographics. So when we shine, it really demonstrates one, that we have genuine partnership, but two, that anybody can do it. And as leaders, you know, that, that really excites me because I know that we can do the best and have the most cutting edge program in California.
I know that. I see the people that are at the table. Our probation chief is brilliant. He is not an ideologue. He is a pragmatist who has taken the best practices from around this state and incorporated them uh, to impact people's lives at the local level. Uh, we have a sheriff that, uh, you know, is has now become, you know, a spokesman on mental health care uh, within our criminal justice system. This is just. You know, am I on candid camera? You know, I, I don't know if I'm in the same place. I mean, it really has shifted dramatically. And, uh, and I'm proud of that. But it really does take everyone sitting down and saying, we're on the same page. We're going to operate in good faith. We're here to demonstrate Kern County can lead. And that has really made a huge difference. So gaps, there's probably some gaps that remain. Tell me what you think those are and how do we bridge those gaps? Well, we always need more money, as you know. We, uh, you know, in Kern County have not always been positioned politically in the best fashion for a whole host of reasons. Uh, and so, you know, getting ourselves up to Sacramento more frequently, rubbing elbows with uh, the right folks uh, and making friends and then being able to communicate what we're doing in a more effective fashion really helps to demonstrate how good we're doing on the ground and what great people we have at the table working together. Despite what we've done in the past or despite the perception of the past, you know, we're here to move forward and to demonstrate we're starting a new chapter. So those, those relationships are improving, but there's still a tremendous gap. So we need to work on that. Uh, that will get us more funding uh, over the long term, which is critical. The more funding we get, the more CBOs, the more beds we can um, pay for to get folks in a sober living environment. Uh, the more programs we can really implement that are evidence-based that we know work in other parts of the country. Uh, so of course that takes money. So that's a huge gap. And then of course capacity. You know, we at any given day have more need for bed space than we can possibly provide. Now, your own constituency that you represent, has the AB 109 influence uh, bettered the communities you represent? Uh, absolutely. And I'll tell you, the thing that has amazed me the most is to have a client walk in the door that I used to represent that was essentially doing life on the installment plan, literally, in and out of a revolving door, and had basically accepted that lot in life, if you will, which is tragic. But to have that kind of person come into my office and say, for the first time ever, my probation officer really cares about me. <laughs> my probation officer is helping me. I think probation officers have always tried to do that. There's no question. They have a tough job. But to have that sentiment be conveyed across the table to folks that are really marginalized and really have every reason to believe society has rejected them and they have lived with perpetual failure um, uh, for their own choice and habits and, and a whole host of reasons, but nonetheless, that tends to be their lot. To have those folks come in and say, I, I feel hopeful that I can get some housing, that I can get a, a get bus pass, that ETR is going to provide work boots if I can get a job laying solar panels. That is revolution. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. You know, there are a lot of people, when AB 109 came into play, uh, became nervous. They were nervous. Of Gosh, we're going to have a bunch of bad guys on the street. Now, what would you say to them if you had an audience? I, I would say public safety remains our top priority. Uh, we've got to protect our children, our families. We have to let pe people know that this community that they're investing into is going to return that investment with a care and concern for them, their families, their property. That's important. That's never not going to be important. Uh, but that we have an opportunity now to invest dollars in a way that we're going to see a return on the investment uh, that makes sense. It's not partisan, that is not conservative or liberal or even moderate. It's just intelligent uh, to say we can maximize the expenditure of a dollar by helping people gain a skill set, affordable housing, and op you know hope at the end, light at the end of the tunnel, uh, and that the result of that is a healthier community and a safer community. So this is really about uh, investment of tax dollars in a way that's intelligent, that is uh, cost effective, that is proven through evidence-based uh, you know, paradigms, and this is really the smarter way to do government. And I, I certainly appreciate people's fears and concerns. I've had, you know, break-ins at my home. I've had, uh, you know, just just last night, my you know sister's window shattered outside of, and a whole host of cars on the street. I mean, we, we have issues. We have problems, and they need to be addressed. Uh, but certainly, getting folks to a place of stability is a smarter investment than simply perpetuating their condition. 
because people who can't compete are going to feed themselves. They're going to be parents. They're going to live a long time in all likelihood, and they're going to do so with the need to take from others in order to survive. And that's just not smart. You know, it is clear that Kern County has stepped up to the plate and just are going for the gold. Now, are you proud to represent us at the state level? Absolutely. And part of what the governor's reaching out to me personally and saying, I want you to sit on the prison board and represent the Central Valley is absolutely that. Uh, while I love to take credit for the, catching the governor's eye, I really think it's much more about Kern County and about the changes Kern County has been willing to implement. Uh, we, for the first time ever in our sheriff's uh, unit, have a kiosk where an individual can walk in, close the door, have a private, dignified conversation with a child support provider uh, to help them be more responsible about their children. And that is not anything we've ever done in the past before. To have our sheriff tout that and be proud of that is really huge. The governor has come down, he has seen that, he has toured it, and he recognizes that we are trying and that we are, uh, you know, made a new, um, you know, developing a new chapter in Kern that says uh, public, public safety is still number one, there's no doubt. We still love our sheriff and we're still working hard uh, to make sure that our communities are safe and that people are held responsible when they are totally out of line. Uh, but certainly we're going to implement best practices and that we believe that the end game is one that is better for everyone and not just a subset of the community. There are certain costs to AB 109 in terms of staffing and financial. What do you think the benefits have been for you personally as well as the County of Kern? Well, there's been a complete shift in the way that probation, for example, sees their role and their duty. The role before was lock them up, send them away, uh, you know, harsh penalties for bad behavior. And certainly there's a lot of reason to believe that that is warranted or fair. Uh, but what we have seen is that that approach tends to cause more crime, more misbehavior. And it isn't uh, necessarily what we want to see at the end of the day in terms of a return on that investment. So what has happened with probation is by implementing, going around the country and seeing best practices, by implementing those at the local level, that probation has actually shifted the way they view their own uh, duties and responsibilities, their own role vis-a-vis -vis an individual that's been placed in their care. Uh, we are all sort of on the line, if you will, for the outcome. Uh, rather than shipping folks away and saying now it's somebody else's problem, now it's the problem of the state of California or CDC. It is actually our problem because we're going to keep a lot of these folks locally, they're going to continue to circumvent uh, the, the system, and lo and behold, they're right back in front of us again. So I think the, the philosophy behind our duties and responsibilities has shifted, and that's critical because hearts and minds have to change, culture has to change in order for us to all be on the same page and to get people's buy-in. You don't force probation officers to do something. You don't force Donnie Youngblood to do anything. That will never happen, as you know. Uh, so uh, with that said, uh, buy-in is so critical. And I think the investment of the dollars has been uh, very good in helping us all become re-educated. You know, Pew MacArthur Foundation, which is an extremely legitimate, very professional, very intelligent group of, of folks that are really interested in helping us get to the end game, have come in. They have done cost-benefit analysis on our programs, and they're helping us see that where we invest a dollar says something about who we are and what we believe about the other person that we are dealing with. It, it, that investment of that dollar is a statement a philosophy of what we're going to do, of who we are, and who we believe they have the potential to be. And so that has shifted. Final comments. You know, I am thrilled and delighted to be at the table at this time in California's history because it is different than any time that we have ever seen before. And while we have been well intended and have wanted to keep our families safe, uh, we haven't always made the best investment of money. And at the end of the day, uh, the taxpayer deserves better, deserves more. And we, our families, deserve a higher standard of living, a higher quality of life. And our children, who are living with the implications of this system, uh, you know, deserve a better shot. And so I am honored and privileged to be able to bring the little expertise I developed in the criminal justice world to the table and say, okay, 
Uh, you have your expertise, uh, you have your expertise, I have mine, let's pool it together, not in an adversarial sense the way I used to as a defense attorney, but in a way that is collaborative, in a way that's intelligent, in a way that really helps people achieve their potential because uh, folks are not reading, meeting their potential. Uh, they just aren't. They, are, they aren't realizing uh, how wonderful life and family can be, you know, when you play by the rules and you uh, sacrifice and invest in your, you know, savings and retirement, the kind of comfort that can bring a person uh, versus a day-to-day -day lifestyle that has no security in it. So I am uh, really delighted. I uh, love what I do. Uh, thrilled to be at the table to be helping people seek redemption because at the end of the day, I am, of course, a big believer in redemption. Well, that philosophy is certainly resonating for us in Kern County. Thank you so much for your service. Thank you. So it's clear, departments and agencies are working together like never before. And it's not just nice, it's necessary. Thank you for joining me on this edition of Inside Kern. On behalf of myself, Mary Beth Garrison, and the entire KGov team, we hope we have shed some light on the challenges of AB 109. You know, one of my favorite phrases is, treat a person as they are, and they will stay that way. Treat them as they can be, and they will become that person. Kern County is working hard to tell people and teach people the way they can be. And it's working. What that means for us, it's working for all of us. Thank you. Uh, I'm happy. I, I feel like, um, I put this in good words. I, I, I feel, it, you know, I feel relieved to leave that old life. I feel like uh -huh. reborn again, you know? Yeah. And I've been feeling that for years or I'm, I'm You're definitely, different. You're I'm a different definitely person. not the bad guy you worry about on the street. Right. I'm Still a, the I'm, laundry guy. I, I, I'm, I'm a really good guy. I speak wrong. You're not a really good guy. Yes, you know, um, and it's nice to know that you guys are taking the time to do what you're doing and to put it out there, you know? Because uh, we, we need more people to be involved, you know? Mm -hmm. Everybody needs to be involved in this world. Not, you know, nobody... Everybody has a job to do. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to all stop being lazy in life and, and help each other. You know, I help, because of the help I've been given, I help a lot of people too, yep. you know? And it feels good to help yeah. people. I tell people, you know what? I told the guy in Florida the other day. Um, his name was Charles, and I gave my number. Charles hasn't called me yet, but I know Charles will probably call me one day. <laughs> and I told Charles, look, Charles, I don't have much time, but you need to go find the people that want to help you. There's people waiting for you to knock on that door. So go knock on the door. And and you know what? I remember he looked at the sky kind of like I did the first day I changed. And I hope Charles is doing good. So, yeah. Victor Adam Sam, Queen Edward Zebra, Persib, Donna Siana. David, Ocean, Nora, Adam, Charles, Ida, Adam, Nora, Ocean, Hispanic Mail, Bay River, 72087. Second would be the last of Evan, Edward, Victor, Adam, Nora, Sam, first of Steven, Sam, Tom, Edward, Victor, Edward, Nora, Black Mail, Bay River, 78051. First, Steven, confirm that you're on the DOB 51 or 61. 10 4, 10 3. Tom Day, 1106 KMC X ray. Four Paul, one good four. Paul, one good four, four Paul, one Adam, 1022. Copy, Kenny. Two Central, one.